good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for having us. Um, even by Jeff's uh, definition, we're more than 20 seconds late. So this is now a time-shifted uh, discussion. <laughs> Uh, all about uh, behavioural planning and what behavioural planning does. And I'm delighted uh, to welcome Liz Duff, Head of Commercial Operations at Total Media, uh, who will be the star of the show for this panel. Uh, and I'm uh, delighted for two reasons. Number one, it's a really interesting topic. Number two, for anybody who was here uh, last year, at about this time I was walking onto this stage, it was during lockdown, we had Maria from DCMN dialed in neatly on the big screen ahead of us. And that lasted for about 10 seconds before we lost audio. And 10 seconds later, we lost video. And that was it. Uh, so as a real, actual human uh, present here, this is, this is a really good start. It's much less dangerous. It is a lot less dangerous. Uh, so first question, Liz. Um, Total is described as the behavioural planning agency. What does, what does that mean? Can you describe your approach in the way that you plan for your clients? Yeah, sure. I suppose if I think about the traditional way of you know approaching media and it's very much about you know who how what so who's our target how are we going to reach them through media what is it we want them to do off the back of it and we approach it from a different point of view yeah. so we start with what so what are the people in our category actually doing we then move to the why, and why are they actually doing it, which leads us to how. So how are we actually going to influence their behaviour and get them to do what we need them to? And the reason that's really important is because as much as we like to think we're not, we're highly irrational beings. Um, we're very emotionally driven. Um, we don't act logically. We say we're going to do things and then do something completely different. Um, so it's very difficult um, to actually get people to shift behaviours. There's a big gap. We talk a lot about the intention action gap and there's a big gap between what people say they're going to do yep. and what they actually do. So what we do is use behavioural science to really drill down into understanding what are people's motivations, how are they feeling, what are they seeing, what are they thinking, and that makes it easier to drive their behaviour change. That makes a lot of sense. So uh, there's a few uh, sections to this, but the first one I want to drill into is really the, the data itself, how you, what you use, how you do it, and then specifically how you can then turn that into actionable strategies. How does that then work in, in the media environment overall? And we'll get on to CTV specifically. Yeah, I think we start from the point of you need to really interrogate data. So data is often incomplete. It can be misleading, it can be misused. Um, so we really start with how can we layer different types of data to really get insights into actual behavior. Um, so an example we often talk about, and I don't get to talk about Katy Perry that often, um, is Katy Perry. Uh, so if you're looking to reach Katy Perry uh, fans, if you look at her Facebook data, her fans are overwhelmingly female. So it makes sense, Katy Perry fans are female. If you look at the Spotify data, so listening data, much more private data, it's pretty much 50-50 in terms of gender, which takes you down a wholly different direction. So if you want to sell Katy Perry merchandise, target women. If you want to sell her records, target both genders. And what we do is really layer up those insights. So it's not just about claim data and what people are saying they're doing, but also looking at what is that implicit behavior and then we layer that with behavioural science, behavioural strategies, but we also use data such as biometrics, so how much attention are people paying. We use things like galvanic skin response, which is something I'd never heard of uh, until we started doing it, but you know, what are the emotional reactions people are having to ads? And it's really layering that up, um, but then also using, I suppose, technology at at the point of activation as well, so working with um, people in the TV landscape to make sure that once we've identified that audience that we're actually reaching them and reaching them in the right mood and the right context. And I suppose in terms of strategies for brands, there are so many that you can use. I think once you dig into the world of behavioural science, there's so many nudges that you can give to people. But thinking about, I suppose, TV specifically, we do things like you can use content or environment for anchoring. So, you know, we, we all know the research that if people see a brand on TV, um, they're more likely to pay more for it um, because they think it's higher quality. So using TV for that. 
Well, you can target, as I mentioned, sort of mood. So if you're a charity, um, if you target people in a sad mood, they're more likely to give to charity to make themselves feel better. OK. You can use day parting. You know, if we see a lot of dating apps targeting people Thursday, Friday nights because they've yep. been out and then they come home, they're a bit lonely. I basically can tell you how to target sad, lonely people, uh, <laughs> which feels a bit cynical. Uh, but you can do it in a positive way as well. You know, we work with brands and how you can drive positive brand association. So, like, again, doing a context um, build. So there's so much you can do. Yeah. But I think it's also thinking, again, in the TV field, there's a lot you can do outside of advertisers as well. I think, you know, in the field of connected TV, um, we can learn a lot from behavioural science as well. I think one thing we talk a lot about is the paradox of choice and how people don't like too much choice. And I think in the world of growing, you know, apps, streaming, so many services, I think we need to learn a lot from that because we, we, there's a lot of research that says if you give people too much choice, they won't make any decision at yes. all, either because it's too difficult or they're worried that they might make the wrong decision. Yeah. So I think we need to help in the TV landscape with discoverability um, and the user experience. And that's really a learning that a behavioral learning that we can apply across the ecosystem. So with the the optionality you have out there for all of the different places that you can currently invest in television uh, and as people who've been here for the, the whole two days so far will know there's more and more coming. Um, do, do, does that fragmentation, do you look at that as a challenge of more stuff to learn, uh, more opportunities, greater fragmentation, or do you see that as an opportunity for m more places to, to uh, apply the learnings you've made on the audiences? Mm. I think it definitely is an opportunity. I think because when you drill down into sort of the different types of audiences, um, the different type of data that you can use. I think that fragmentation actually gives you lots more relevant context and ways that you can talk to people on a much more personal level. Um, and we, again, have a lot of research that's showing, you know, if you target people in their passion points when they're more engaged, if yep. it's something they've specifically chosen to watch, um, then it's much more effective. And I think, Fragmentation will be a problem because it obviously diversifies that audience and it makes yes. them harder to reach at scale, but it makes it easier to have that sort of one-to-one -one conversation that I think a few people have spoken about today. And uh, uh, so totally, you actually doing that now? Is this a sort of a vision of the future or is this working and operational with some of your clients? It's definitely working now. We do a lot of work um, around creative optimization. Yep. Um, and there's a lot around how you can tweak just the copy in your ad to talk to different audiences in different ways. And there's different personality types react to different types of messaging. So, you know, if you know your audience is an extroverted personality, you talk to them very differently to how you talk to an introvert. You talk to a conscientious person in a very different way um, that you talk to, to a different person. Yep. So, and it's not saying you need to go out and make 27,000 different TV ads, but it's just about the messaging, tweaking it and making it relevant to the audience. And again, I think particularly with connected TV, that really opens up the possibilities to use those behavioral learnings. And is this, at a, at a macro level, impacting the way that your share of spend would work, for example? Are you seeing kind of a, a bigger share of your total investments come towards a TV screen, or is it static? Or how, how does that look for you? It really does depend by client and okay. what we're trying to do. It's, it's, we're certainly not saying that we don't do broad targeting yeah. um, approaches and want to go for high reach and high impact. And it's, it's all about very niche targeting. Um, as I said, some of the examples I gave are much more around sort of mood, emotion, context. So we're still directing a lot of spend towards, you know, the linear TV, traditional TV landscape. Yeah. Um, but it's, I mentioned before, sort of the data layering that's adding that additional element to it. And I think as the market grows, that just opens up more and more opportunities. And are you finding the TV providers you're working with now are, are making that richer for you? Is, there, is any of the data that you now get back from the television kind of part of that uh, planning approach? Yeah, it's definitely helping. And it's, it's sort of helping us measure the effectiveness of it. Okay. I think it's still quite difficult to do. Um, but as I said, sort of with more of a connected landscape, it is making it easier to get the data and to sort of serve out those different messages.
So let's, you, you mentioned some of the, uh, the client approach, and I think there was a session earlier, uh, Tom Roach at Jellyfish, talking about uh, this bothism, the idea of kind of brand and performance, uh, putting them both together, and, and the television is arguably now something that had historically been one, now very much the opportunity uh, for it to be the other. So are there brands or categories that you're seeing at Total that have got a real opportunity to, to now go further than they've done before on television? Yes, definitely. I think we're seeing quite a few DTC brands really driving it and seeing seeing the advantage of it. But we we always come back to rather than talking about brand or performance, we go back to the business outcome and yeah. how do you actually achieve that? And I think quite often brands still come to you with a very set thought about how they're going to get to where they want to be. Yeah. Um, and actually, we help them and work with them to take a step back. I think we've got some great examples of a couple of subscription brands who thought they knew who they wanted to target. And again, it goes back to the data. They spoke to audiences. They said, will you subscribe um, to this type of content? The audiences said yes. They put out their activity targeting that audience, and it didn't give them the conversions they wanted. When you then drill back to the data yeah. um, and look at the behavioral data, it actually tells you a completely different audience are actually the ones that are going to subscribe and convert. So once you change your audience to based on um, sort of behavioral insights rather than what people are telling you they're going to do, it gives you a different outcome. We've seen a similar one for another brand that we've worked with through our consultancy. Here again, came to us with a TV ad and said, we just want to reach as many people as possible with this ad. We want to drive a slightly older audience. And we took a step back and we looked at actually their product, yep. um, spoke to people about it. And it turns out no matter how many of their audience that they wanted, they drove to their product, they, the content just didn't resonate with them. So they were just bouncing straight out again. So we took a step back and strange for a media agency didn't take their media money um, and said you actually need to work with influencers, different influencers, change your product um, before you throw any money at that. And that's sort of a different approach to it. Um, but so rather than going with what the brand said of we just want to drive this performance, this many downloads, this, this much CPA, we step back and said, actually, what's the problem we're trying to tackle here? And I think that's the bigger piece. And I think we can deliver that, both of those pieces, through the current TV landscape. Yeah, that because one of the big categories that's been uh, very good for television over the last five years or so have been the, the D2C brands, mm. the kind of the growth of the online-only uh, brands who've recognized the power of TV and, and come into it. Um, but lots of these have quite a... Uh, they've got a, quite an immediate ability to see effectiveness. There's, there's a call to action that's embedded and you can start to make direct links. So it's interesting, do you have any of the, the brands who are really uh, sort of moving that, that branding spend, the long term rather than the short term uh, piece and, and still seeing CTV as a, a new way of working? Definitely, because I think we're all understanding how the TV consumer is changing. And I think we're going to see... Um, that accelerating even more in the current economic landscape. And, you know, we've already seen people unsubscribing from streaming services. It's driving the, the shift towards AVOD. Yep. Um, and I think that's going to move the audience more quickly than it has done historically. Um, and that just means a bigger audience that we can reach through the power of TV, but using all those different sort of behavioural elements that we've spoken about. Yeah, I mean, the... Uh, the economic forecasts that we're seeing now are gloomier than your average Spanish football fan <laughs> uh, at the moment. Um, we're, we're in for a pretty tough uh, 2023, but it, it does, uh, and certainly we see this at Roku in terms of the amount of uh, time invested and the users who are, who are watching the ad-supported uh, offerings across the entire platform. Uh, the SVOD piece is still very much growing, but, but AVOD uh, is the fastest uh, kind of growing uh, piece of, of that. And as you... Uh, as you, if we go back to those, the data sets that you're using, how are the newer players uh, to the TV landscape? How receptive are they to be able to embed that and, you, and you know, use your, what you want to for targeting? Um, and are there kind of lessons or things that both new and legacy players should be doing better for you? I think they are generally very receptive, actually, um, much more than some of the more traditional setups just because they're more used to working in that way and sort of are understanding the, the rationale behind it. Yeah. I think for 
in sort of the AVOD space, I suppose, going back to what I was saying at the start around sort of the intention action gap, I think we can work together um, as, as a sort of an industry to help drive viewers that way. Um, because I think thinking about, and I think someone spoke about this earlier, sort of behaviours in the recession, people are naturally going to be spending more time at home, watching more TV. Um, and there's a behavioural model that says to get someone to change their behaviour or take on a new behaviour, they have to have high motivation, um, which if you think an audience at home who don't want to pay for subscriptions necessarily, um, but want to have the same sort of content, they've got that high motivation. But the other factor in it is ease. So we need to make it as easy as possible for them to do it. And if you've got high motivation and it's easy to do, um, the final part of the equation is giving triggers to people to act. Um, so I think as, for example, AVOD suppliers, you just you need to get in front of your audience and give them those nudges and triggers. So putting the right form of content in front of them yeah. um, and talking to them in the right way. Makes sense. The, uh, the clients you have clearly bought into that behavioral planning led approach to the way that they uh, want to get people to, to think, behave, etc. Does that change maybe the outlook in terms of their media spending at a time like this? Obviously, if you read the press, we're in uh, a time where lots of clients are really evaluating the marketing budgets very, very hard. Uh, some of them have already made cuts, others are looking at it. I think the, the agency reports that are coming out right now are, are sort of definitely bringing down the overall level of growth. Uh, different forms of TV have, have different variants on that. But are you, do you see a, a difference for your clients when they do buy into that approach and actually you now arguably could offer more value um, in some of the media outlets that are out there? Yeah, we very much talk to our clients about effectiveness rather than efficiency. Okay. Um, and when they buy into that, it means they understand the value of sort of maintaining that spend. What we're doing... A lot of at the moment is talking to clients around evaluating where their product and their category sits in the market and how you need to talk to people differently depending on where you sit. So, for example, we work with a lot of FMCG brands, who's obviously an essential product. Yep. People, um, even in tough economic times, are still going to have to buy them, but their behaviours change. So they, as you'd expect, do a lot more price comparisons. They shop around a lot more. They look for promotions. They change their purchase behaviours, so they might purchase less frequent, frequently or consume less. And with products and categories like that, we're sort of seeing the value of things like addressable TV using retail data, target purchase behaviours, yeah. deliver different messaging to different audiences depending on their behaviours. But then if you're in the sort of less essential, more um, discretionary um, type of categories, again, it's a different behaviour that yeah. we see. Um, so consumers do become more cautious and their behaviour changes, so they may reassess the brands that they buy. They might defer their spending. They might come out of the category entirely. And in that sort of area, that's where sort of continuing a brand spend is so important. And again, we're, we're sort of using the power of TV to have that continuing conversation. Yep. So I think it, it very much differs, but yeah, we can, we can see the different approaches you can take depending on what your specific audience is doing. Brilliant. With uh, the clock ticking down, I've got one last question for you, which is your, uh, your approach is, is different to some of the agencies out there. Um, what type of skill sets do you really value at Total Media that you might not be if you were at another uh, agency with a different kind of approach? Um, and kind of how easy is that to find in the current environment? Yeah. Recruitment drive, come work for me. Um, it is a slightly different. I mean, it's, it's, we still look for very talented, you know, media buyers, media traders, but we also have some depressingly smart people who work for us, so psychologists. We've got people who've got doctorates in behavioral psychology. Um, but we also try and, as much as possible, get sort of such a, as diverse a range of workforce as we possibly can, because the key thing to it is getting that diversity of thought, diversity of opinion, diversity of behavior. Um, so we need to learn from that 
as well. Um, but it's also so not to say we don't you know, rely on data. So again, we have a lot of data scientists, data engineers. So it's, it's a broad range, um, but it, it basically just means it, it adds an extra element um, to the role, which makes it very interesting. Brilliant. And final one with three seconds left. Three seconds to go. Uh, you can get one thing for Christmas from all the media owners in the room. What is it? <laughs> I didn't tell you I was going to ask that. You didn't. Wine. <laughs> wine. It's there we go. Wine. You heard it here first. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Liz Duff. <laughs> right, thank you. And I think that was the best answer of the day, the wine. Thank you to that Probably person, thank you everyone else in the audience for joining us for this panel. And this is going to be a good one, I promise you. Um, so, are you sit you're not sitting in, in headshot order, it doesn't matter, you can join the dots. Um, we have an illustrious panel before us. We're here to talk about breaking new ground in connected TV. I'm Omar Oaks, I'm the media leader. And so, what is this panel all about? We're going to fly across different areas of connected TV to get to the heart of what advertisers, publishers are looking for. How do we measure connected TV? What's possible and not possible? What we need going forward? Getting into me what media buyers are thinking about or worrying about when it comes to being in ad breaks with connected TV. Um, I also want to explore ad formats and conventions we see in traditional TV and how we replicate that or not replicate that in connected TV. And if there's time, we might get into a bit of Netflix, Disney Plus, sports. There's a lot there already. Um, first, very importantly, how do we know someone is actually in the room when we're measuring connected TV? Um, I want to ask about co-viewing. Chris, you're already smiling and nodding. <laughs> <laughs> you're keen to answer this. Chris and Rekko Tim, how do we think, how do we measure this? Yeah, well, co-viewing has been quite important to us. I mean, when we took the, uh, the free-to-view service to market, we were really keen to understand how the user was, was watching the content. So. We did a number of studies into co-viewing and uh, across Europe established that about three quarters of the audience are watching with at least one other person. So that became quite key um, and has certainly been part of the commentary of us exploring that further. Does it increase engagement if there's more than one person in the room? Um, uh, and pieces of research that we've done is established it has because it can create discussion points. It can also increase um, higher levels of engagement in the creative. So. Um, it's, it's been a forefront of what we've been talking when going to market, talking about the household as opposed to the, the individual, because um, it's the biggest screen in the household. Okay. Um, Graham from Sky Media, I'd like to bring you in. Obviously, Sky has announced a lot of things this year in terms of you've just launched a streaming stick. Um, Sky Glass, the new television, has been around for a while. Um, so has this, has this enabled you to better measure so-called co-viewing or how have you been doing that up to this point and maybe give us an insight what you could be doing going forward? Yes, yeah, so I, I suppose the, the stock answer from a broadcast would be we rely very heavily on Barb. You know, all, all of our measurement is um, very much focused around kind of how do we, how do we um, support a standardised system that, that kind of, you know, everyone can sit on and, and kind of uh, benefit from. So, so that would be our first pulse of call. Um, new, new products like Stream um, and, and like Glass will, will, in the fullness of time, give us opportunities to, to actually be able to kind of understand how many people are in a room. But for the time being, it's very much based around, you know, what Barb says around kind of how, how many people are, are viewing it at, at any one time. And beyond that, I suppose it's, it's, we get into the kind of, um, into the realms of, you know, how, how response, you know, look, looking at response from advertising campaigns and seeing, look, there's clearly kind of multiple people kind of responding from one place. But. And um, just briefly, is anything surprising you about the, the data that you're seeing with these new customers coming on Sky Glass, but it's too early for the stick? 
Not, not really, to be honest. I mean, I think the, you know, to, not to veer off into kind of um, di different territory, but I, I guess so, some of the learnings we're, we're finding around the, the sort of homepage. So when you first go into a Skyglass kind of ecosystem, um, you're faced with a, with a slightly different kind of setup than, than say, SkyQ. Um, we're obviously trying to make sure that they're, they're as kind of comparable and, and as, as alike as possible, but certainly if you put kind of loads of kind of glossy tiles up in front of a viewer, they're more likely to engage with the tiles than necessarily go into what we'd known as a kind of traditional kind of broadcast experience where you're kind of a click away from um, live TV. Um, but yeah, outside of that, um, it's, it's, it's fairly kind of, we're learning a lot as we go around kind of what, you know, what viewers are doing when they're faced with a slightly different, um, different kind of homepage. Okay. Um, just remind the audience, we do have um, people with microphones on the sides if you do have a question. Um, I'll try and, with about 10 minutes left, I'll try and ask. Just raise your hand. The light's very bright, so you have to really go for it. Um, Dean um, from Deliveroo. Um, so from the advertiser side, um, given what you've just heard from two platforms, media owners, um, in terms of how we measure co-viewing, does this satisfy you? Maybe give it a mark out of 10. What, what, what more do you want actually from media owners, platforms, in order to give you the, the connected TV advertising measurement data you want? I don't think I'll mark your work on stage. I think that'd be ever so slightly rude. But um, I think as a, as a technology business and a marketing team within a technology business, we often get asked like how we measure in our TV and, and, and what's the effectiveness. And that always would be the long-term investment and how that's having an impact on, our, impact on our brand, but also the short-term impact. And I think the way that we would perceive that is that when we work with the likes of um, Channel 4 or ITV on their data matching products, and uh, what we're able to do is run lift tests and get a really good understanding of, well, if we've served this person an ad and this person hasn't seen an ad, what the relative lift is. And then obviously, if you're seeing an ad and there's an action that happens from a short-term impact perspective, then we can perceive that they've seen that ad and there's been an action. So we're always looking at different ways to experiment and working with our broadcasters and our partners and our agencies directly to work out, well, what are the right experiments we should be running that give us those answers? Uh, and then using that to then, OK, well, what's the next iteration of that and the next iteration of that? So constantly testing things alongside our media mix modeling to understand, well, what is the true impact if someone is or is not seeing our ads? And has that, become e has that become easier at all, or is it even more difficult? We've heard so much in the last couple of days about media fragmentation, test and learn. Is it getting any easier? It is getting easier. I was using an example earlier about how actually you can do that with Channel 4 and ITV, but actually you can't do that with Google. Um, maybe slightly brave to sit on stage and, and, and be negative about Google, um, but hey-ho, we're doing it anyway. Um, Sorry, just for anyone who's not clear, what do you mean you can't do it? Yeah, so, so a really good example is if, uh, um, if I serve an ad on a connected TV and that's a logged-in environment and I'm able to match that data of that consumer from my consumer set with a, a broadcaster or a walled garden, we're then able to understand whether that ad was exposed and whether an action actually happened. For example, my understanding right now is that if I was to buy that ad on YouTube and then that person performed an action on their phone, that ecosystem doesn't currently allow for that same level of measurement. So it's really interesting when you think about the way the ecosystem has changed that previously you'd have said that Google or YouTube for a certain point is far more advanced in that space, where actually I'd say the broadcasters have caught them up and have maybe even overtaken them to a certain point in that specific use case. That's quite interesting you bring up YouTube because it, I don't want to get into the debate whether that's TV, but it's interesting that you're thinking about that within your, your, your TV budget and your TV spend. Um, Paul, um, Paul from Publica, I mean, that's an interesting example of kind of how a brand is thinking about this. We think about the ad break, for example, yeah. connected TV, different BVOD, SVOD, AVOD formats. How, are, we, are we seeing anything different in terms of how publishers are, are building their ad breaks for advertisers? I think if you're a smart streaming publisher today, the way you're thinking about your ad break is trying not only to just attract traditional TV ad budgets, but it's also how do you attract digital and social ad budgets as well. So in traditional TV ad buying, it's been very easy to understand the context of the show in which you're going to advertise around. It's been very easy to understand the position within the ad break in which your ad is going to appear. But in CTV, thus far, it's been quite difficult for advertisers to really get that level of insight and understanding around what's happening within CTV ad breaks. So ad servers like Public exist today to help streaming publishers really construct ad breaks and not only enable those on the buy side to have transparency and controls, 
but, um, but also to attract digital and social advertisers so they can understand things like context, content parameters, position with an ad break, whether or not they're going to run back to back with their competitors. Um, they're the types of things that we're seeing publishers really thinking about today when they're building out their yield strategies when it comes to building intelligent ad pods that they can monetize either directly or via programmatic channels. Okay. Um, Lolly Smiler from Peach, I mean, so, so your business is all about trying to make digital advertising work as well as broadcast advertising has. Um, so in the midst of all of this conversation, what about the user experience? Yeah. Um, we've also heard a lot in the last couple of days about how important creative still is. Uh, was it Kelly Williams from ITV yesterday said that we need to compete really hard on content um, but collaborate on technology. So. I've not heard a lot yet about the user experience. Yes. So yeah. is this something that tends to get forgotten about? It's partly due to my questioning. But is it, is it, <laughs> some, is it, is it something that um, we need to be mindful of and kind of where are the, the pitfalls? Mm. Yeah, I think it's easy as an industry to sort of focus on how we do things in a way that's better for us and sort of make life easy and, and get excited around the sort of um, opportunities around audience targeting and, and so forth. And this happens certainly in digital media kind of in the in the earlier 2000s where we got very excited about capabilities but didn't think so much about um, the actual user experience as a result, ad blocking etc went up and it, it started to affect business models. Um, I think something we can do that will help um, the move and I think will also help to sort of win budget over perhaps for some of the um, CTV players from traditional broadcast is to start to ensure that we we do keep the user experience at the forefront of, of whatever we're doing um, and also maintain the, the same sort of trusted experiences in broadcast in a CT environment. So there are, um, for decades within um, broadcast, there's, there's been a very strong focus on um, quality and checks and balances. So there's been a very rigorous approach to ensuring um, creatives are properly QC'd, that, um, the creatives have gone through regulators, etc. Um, it's very rare within broadcast to see something like um, multiple ads accidentally in a, an ad break or an ad that, um, that has the um, audio slightly off sync or the ad, as I saw quite recently, gets chopped off before it's finished in an ad break. Whereas I've seen all of those three things just within the past week on a few occasions on, on CTV. So I think if we bring the same rigour into the CTV environment, that'll start to give brands the confidence to um, invest more mm. and, and start to put a little bit more focus on some of the newer media owners. Mm. Um, that sounds great, but quite expensive. <laughs> uh, are, are, are we able to do this? Is this, prohib is this this paradigm that Lolly's talking about, are we able to do this? Yeah, I, well, certainly from a... There are, there are several CTV ad servers today that can absolutely give those controls to streaming publishers. So again, if you knock on Dean's door and you say, Dean, I want you to advertise in my, my CTV app, but I can't tell you the context of the show, I can't tell you the position, mm. I can't give you any type of audience data, you can't measure it, you'd say, go away, Paul. I've been up to that in <laughs> traditional TV advertising for the last 30 years. Why would you expect me now to advertise in CTV if you can't even give me the same basic mm. understanding of where my ad is going to appear? So lots of technology companies have spent the last several years trying to bring the controls of traditional TV to addressable TV, but also the precision mm. of digital targeting. So it's now this hybrid world where streaming publishers can go into agencies and brands and say, look, you can do everything you've been doing on traditional broadcast, but in CTV, but you can also now start to apply some of the digital targeting that's worked so well for you in other channels, but on the biggest screen in the household. So to answer your question, yes, it is possible today, but you have to be working with technology companies that have been built from the ground up around the nuances of streaming and television. It, the technology is very different from display technology. It's very different from video technology. So again, you have to make sure that you're working with a CTV first partner. Yeah. Um, it's, oh, sorry, it's not necessarily expensive. It's just around building that into yeah. everything you do from the start. If we go down the wrong route now and start sort yeah. of chucking sort of quality, regulatory focus, et cetera, to one side, it's going to be much harder to bring things back later. So if we build things up well now and get the right workflows in place, I think we'll, we'll all benefit. OK. Um, what do you think it's going to mean for Connected TV once these programmatic systems we've just been talking about, once you can guarantee first in ad break or maybe last in ad break as well? Um, 
how are you going to do things like contextual based targeting, competitive separation, same categories of advertisers, keeping them at a distance? Um, Lolly. Okay. Well, I think this is a good, this is a very good step towards starting to replicate the sort of broadcast type experience um, in a programmatic environment. Um, there are still some issues at the moment we've noticed with, um, so we deal with a combination of kind of post-production um, brands, broadcast aside to kind of help ease creative workflows. But for the first time, we've started to see the, um, the sort of production start, uh, side, brand side start to get confused, for instance, about exactly where creative's meant to go, what, what the workflow is, who's managing what. We had a quick green room chat around kind of programmatic creatives being sent directly to a media owner, etc. as well. So I think in addition to improving the actual ad experience, I think we also need to do something about kind of e easing the pipes as well. I think budget will come over if it's, it's easy to add, say, an extra um, uh, broadcaster onto a broadcast media plan. It's suddenly a whole lot more complicated to work out if you want to say, but media on Pluto, it's like, is it through the... Is it through this DSP or that one? Is it direct? Is it through Sky? Um, so I think if we make life easier on that front, as well as enhancing the actual ad experience, we can um, make, make great strides. OK. Um, what I thought was interesting, if um, anyone caught the, the interview with um, Netflix head of ad sales, Jeremy Gorman, yesterday, um, she was talking about for the moment, you know, we're going to do standard 40, 40 second, 30 second, 20 second, 10 second formats. Um, but in the future, they're going to look at maybe doing something different, depending on how innovative they can be. Um, Chris, I mean, how, what, what do actu advertisers actually want in this space? And how, you know, how creative do you think they're willing to be going forward? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question because we're getting demand from the clients and we're being agile enough to sort of react to that demand. And one of them has been to adapt to different ad durations. So whereas the 30 second used to be the standard, the norm, um, which um, we build the ad pods on that set, um, the demand now is more for 10 seconds. Now, whether that's because of the attention measurement, which is obviously a big topic of discussion at the moment, but uh, we've adapted to that and we're seeing far greater volume of the short duration ads in this space um, to adapt to the, the, the KPIs of the creative, um, whether it's rotation of 10 seconds or whether it's individual pieces of creative. It's, uh, it's where the demand is at the moment. I'm sure that will continue, but uh, we, just, we adapt as and when that demand changes. So is that going to be an added consideration? We, you know, I mentioned competitive separation, kind of not having the same groups of advertisers clustered together in ad break. You know, if it's just 10 second ad, 10 second ad, 10 second ad, 10 second ad, kind of how, how, you know, how much, how much do advertisers care, Dean? What's your experience of this? How much would that concern you, for example? And what you describe is in the Italian marketplace, right? Where they have these same ad breaks, but lots of shorter ad breaks and they bundle it together. I think. I mean, Netflix have hit a really good nail on the head there, which is there's lots of different things that advertisers want to do. And if we're thinking about the different levels of audiences and segmentations that can be done, not just in Netflix, but in other, in other partners, where we could just do like our strategic reach and frequency based on our core audiences, or we can look at Axiom segments, for example, or we can look at um, uh, our own uh, first party data and uh, model that out. We might then want to think about, well, that's one set, that one audience is a 10 second nudge or a six second bumper, or actually if we're trying to build the brand with a different, a new consumer set, that might be a 30 second. So actually, you start to got all these different um, strings to your bow to be like, well, actually, if I start to combine these different uh, attributes together, then actually I can have a bit more storytelling in, in the consumers that I'm try, trying to attract. So actually, it's not, it's not about just, well, I want to do a 30 because I'm doing this. You then need to think from a production perspective of what are the jobs that need to be done across all of my business goals and how am I going to interact with my consumers through, through AV in that manner. So I like the fact that Netflix and, and other partners are starting to think about that, where actually it's not just going to be a, a 30 second because I can afford it or a 10 second because of inflation. It's actually going to be different things that as a brand I need to achieve and there's different audiences behind that. And they're giving us the tools to do that, which I think is really exciting. Um, Paul, do you think it's important for Connected TV to replicate what we had with traditional linear or you know if Netflix were to go off in a very different direction just for argument's sake um, maybe that wouldn't be the way to go 
Um, not necessarily. That television is still television. Um, we haven't, you know, it's not a new invention that we've suddenly discovered. Um, it's still the biggest screen in the household. But the way the content reaches the viewer, that's changed. The plumbing, the mechanics behind the scenes. And with that has brought a lot of opportunity to advertisers. Again, the data, the technology, the programmatic tools to really start drilling into targeting, understanding how your TV advertising is working, using data from your TV campaigns to inform other parts of your marketing strategy. Um, so I think we've got the best of traditional TV, again, with all of the precision and granularity that digital has been delivering to marketeers for the last 10 or 15 years. So we're not reinventing the wheel. TV is still very much television. Again, it's just the back-end mechanics are changing. And that's not only good for, for viewers, because it means they can discover more content organically. It's very, very good for marketeers, because they've got much more controls around how their TV ad budgets are actually working. Um, you say you're not reinventing the wheel, but Sky, for example, I can pick on you, Graham. You know, you're announcing lots of interesting things in terms of, I think this week it was Skip Ad. You'll be able to pay to Skip Ads in future. I mean, is that, is that kind of cognizant of the advertising experience has changed and you need to offer different things? I think a lot of people might have regarded that with surprise that you'd do that. Yeah, so um, there's, there's no official launch of that or anything uh, quite, quite yet. But, but I think on, on the general point of just kind of trying to evolve and move, um, move us forward, um, of course, we're kind of looking at all kinds of things. So, so whether that's kind of using first party data, you know, we've been doing that for years, whether it's um, about, you know, pushing into kind of shoppable, we started kind of working out how, how could you streamline the path to purchase for some like, you know, Dean's brand um, is, is kind of transaction on the big screen actually where it's going to go or is it because it's always going to be companion app what do you need to do to the creative to make it you know incite slightly more response um, all those sorts of things are kind of areas that we'll push into I think I think the main thing for everyone and especially Dean and brands uh, like these we, we, we need to be kind of standardized in the way that we do it of course we need to kind of test all of these different ways of doing stuff um, but, but we need a trusted ecosystem that everyone kind of understands the rules, understands what they need to kind of do from a regulation perspective um, and, and, and really start to kind of understand how, how you can kind of deliver at scale across all of these new oh. platforms. Um, we've got just under 10 minutes left. Does anyone have a question for the panel based on anything you've heard or not heard? Um, one thing you're not allowed to ask is what's for lunch? Um, that'd be a surprise for everyone later. Um, if you do have a question, please wave. Someone will hand you a microphone. Um, let's talk a bit about sport. Um, sport is obviously, when we talk about linear, programmatic, live sports and news is obviously the thing that people are still watching live. Um, but in terms of how we measure that in connected TV, I mean, again, great sport. Sport is hugely important to Sky. How many people are actually watching it on digital platforms and how are you measuring that? Um, it's going to be interesting to see with ITVX, how many people have been watching the World Cup on ITVX, will it work maybe, um, versus um, on TV, on, on traditional TV. How are you measuring that and how is it changing? So it's, it's all sits behind that kind of barb um, kind of set of standards. So it's, it's very much, um, we, we, we've kind of basically transitioned everything we possibly could from a you know, from a, from a standardized and trusted framework in, in kind of linear into all of these new platforms. Sports, one of those um, unique bits of content that, as you say, needs to be what's live. I think something like 90%, if you look at all the different channels across Sky, you can get something like Atlantic, probably only 10% of it's what's live. And then you go to, to another channel like a Sky Sports and probably 90% of it's live. Um, that's very much the case in, in these new kind of CTV and kind of digital platforms where um, people need to see it straight away. Um, and equally, we need to get the advertising experience right. So Paul referenced all, all these kind of precision ways of being able to target across, um, across these, these new ecosystems is, is very important. Typically, what we'll find is advertisers like the idea of they'll pay slightly kind of premium rates for being around sport, um, but they want mass. So they don't necessarily want to target very niche audiences across sport. They want to kind of be there in front of the World Cup, in front of the Premier League, um, and hit as many of, you know, as, as many, as, as much audience as possible. Um, timing crucial as well. I mean, um, Dean from Delivery, I mean, you do, you know, you've had England footballers in your advertising. Um, not so long ago, obviously for you and other quick service delivery last mile companies, 
life support's incredibly important. Are you getting what you need in terms of the data, in terms of your ad campaigns with Connected TV? Um, I mean, to think, think about the, the live sports example, um, I was actually given a, an example, uh, I was actually given a presentation internally about content consumption. And the last time there was, I think, 20 million people watching the same program in the UK was the Only Fools and Horses Christmas special. And I was presenting this to a group of 20 year olds who didn't know what Only Fools and Horses was. <laughs> so that was Shocking. slightly concerning. You need to explain it now. <laughs> no, yeah, no, no, I don't think I'd be able to. And um, I think what's really interesting is that there probably is still, and we used the last, the last Euros final of the World Cup, there probably was still 20 million people watching that program, uh, that watching that game, but in different places. And I think what that actually allows you to do is to really understand the different type of audiences, the devices they use to consume that content and what, the value, what, what value that brings. Um, so I think that's what's really interesting, and it's going to be interesting to understand how those, like the Dazones, for example, how those, those, those platforms start to scale, and offer the different targeting and the different ways of working that brands are going to start to want, whether that's integrated sponsorships, or whether that is badging, or whether that's uh, different ad breaks, or I think there's actually real value in there that I don't think anyone's really started to explore yet, and it's going to get really exciting as sport goes more into that space and, and different rights gets, um, gets uh, sucked up, and, and we get to see more sport in those environments. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? Because I can see a future, a pretty near future, in which we start to see Apple, Amazon, Netflix start competing for Premier League rights. Um, we're seeing more American ownership in the Premier League in particular, where they have a history of dealing with franchises and even you know, in the NFL, for example, they are media owners in their own right to an extent. And they, uh, do, you, do you think this is broadly a good thing or a bad thing? Um, I'm not going to ask Graham from Sky, who might think it's Thanks. a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm happy to take that one, I think. And, and we discussed this a little bit earlier, which is as the ecosystem for TV and content becomes more expanded and, and sort of slightly chaotic, if planners don't have the right tools to understand where these audiences are going to exist, and, and we have a fragmented, I mean, even football, if it's on Amazon, mm. if it's on BBC for the highlights, it's on Sky, it's on BT, I mean, it's, it could be on DAZN if it's, it's, if it's uh, one of the Syria A. Like, that audience is consuming all these places, but actually, if you've only got reach curves of three of those channels, like, how are you supposed to plan against that? Mm. So actually, it becomes a question of, well, how do we make sure that those planners have the right tools to buy the right audiences for the brands that are trying to buy these certain consumer sets? So actually, I think there's, there's a, like a job to be done in understanding, well, if we fragment content, then we need to be able to make sure that the people who are buying those ad breaks have the tools and the data available to them mm. to make the right decisions for their clients. OK. Um, we've only got a few minutes left. Um, so quick fire round. I promised them um, a bit of chat on Netflix and Disney. So. Hope you'll all stay tuned for the Disney interview after lunch. But before we get into that, how much of a game changer do you think it's going to be now that they've got their, their ad funded tiers? I'm just going to go in a line. Yes. Oh, I, I think very big for a few reasons. One is tipping point in terms of volumes into CTV outside of BVOD for the first time, which should obviously bring budgets innovation. The other thing is they've chosen for, I think, the, the first time of any um, new sort of broadcast streamer I've seen. They've gone straight for programmatic first approach. They've also gone with a global um, sales house. So they're set up to properly scale across all regions. They've also broken out of standard broadcast um, regulatory bodies, etc. So I think they've set themselves up to work in a, a truly scalable way globally. Um, they're doing things a little bit differently. Um, they may set a path or they might kind of break things and set back a bit, but we don't think so. Um, it looks like they're, they're doing the right things so far, and it'll be interesting to see how that changes the way other um, media owners are working. So game changer marks that, I think? Yeah, game changer. Uh, out of 10, eight. Eight. <laughs> eight to nine. Graham? Yeah, com a good mark is a competitive mm. one. Um, I'm captain boring today. I'd say <laughs> it just needs to be kind of standardised so that you know, Dean and all those brands can kind of use it in a really kind of um, trusted way. Do I have to score it as well? Yes. <laughs> Five. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think they're, they're making all the right moves. It's really, really interesting to see that they've adopted Barb 
Um, they haven't been drawn into the measurement debate of panels versus impressions. Straight mm -hmm. off the bat, they've looked at the currency of choice for TV ad buyers in the UK, which is barbed today, and they've adopted it. That enables them to capture traditional TV ad budgets. They've also adopted um, third-party digital measurement from companies like Integral Ad Science. That also positions them very well to capture digital first and programmatic ad budgets. Um, so I think they've been extremely strategic in those particular moves, and I would give them a nine. It would be a ten if they were using a public ad server. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well done. Uh, and very briefly, um, if, before I go on to Chris, um, what do you think, Microsoft? It's interesting for Microsoft. What do you think if you're Microsoft looking at this Netflix business? What, what, what would you predict in the future? What might happen there? I'd be very happy. <laughs> um, it's a tough question. I don't know the answer to that. I think. Microsoft are extremely well placed to accelerate the go-to-market strategy for Netflix. Um, very good partnership. They've got deep-rooted relationships with agencies. They understand the programmatic ecosystem. They've got a legacy of harnessing data and technology to fuel yield for publishers. So I think um, it's a really strong relationship. That's what's called a leading question. Uh, <laughs> Chris, uh, game changer, marks out of 10. I mean, look, it's going to be super exciting for the CTV space. It's giving more visibility to this sector rather than it just being an add-on to the broadcast schedule. It's going to be seen as an equal standing um, if you look at the overall space. So it's exciting, but from a healthy competition perspective, you know, I'm not going to be as optimistic as a nine. I'm going to go in with a seven and a half because there's two sides of the coin. Um, but yeah, it's exciting, but it's um, and it, certainly for the, the space, but for, for the, the smaller publishers, it's uh, a, a big, a big giant coming into the space. Mm. Yes, yes. Um, Dean, final word to you. Yeah, it's, it's another tick, right? I mean, if, as I as I picture myself flicking through my Samsung right now, um, plug not intended, um, I start to think about the different tiles that are there, and, and the more of them we can serve ads on and reach consumers as a brand, like that's super exciting, right? So I think it's a Maybe an eight, I guess. Like I think, I think as, as we start to see more ad-funded models, I think that's, that's a good thing for, for brands and for broadcasters. Mm. Maybe not for consumers, but... Uh, my very adult mental math tells me that's an average of eight out of ten. So um, thank you very much. Thank you to the panel. Thank you in the audience. And enjoy lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you.